John, big news to discuss about the future of the media and the NBA. And golf, as we have the first interview with Mike McCarley, the founder of TGL, the company he launched with Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy. I don't think any animals will show up like they did on the Manning cast this week. Well, what is our, what is, what is that? It, that donkey looks like you eating, Peyton. It's the same thing. All right, we're going to break. We're going to break, Peyton. We'll be back. And we're back. The Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshan, sports media columnist for the New York Post. He's John Oran, the media reporter for the Sports Business Journal. We'll have Michael McCarley uh, from the TGL in a few. Uh, but as always, John, let's go. Who's up? Who's down? Who's, who's up? up? Who's, who's down? down? I'll start us off, Andrew. My who's up is Bill Koenig, who is the top media executive at the NBA, and he is the architect of a deal cut with Diamond Sports that gives the NBA a ton of flexibility with its local rights. The basic deal terms, NBA teams that have deals with Bally Sports Nets will get a 16% cut in their rights fee revenue this year. In exchange, this is what the NBA gets. All of their team deals with Bally Sports end after this season. All of those teams this season are given a package of at least 10 games that they can uh, sell to over-the-air broadcasters to, in part, mitigate the 16% decrease in rights fees. And the NBA was given an out in case Diamond goes belly up at some point dur during the season. Diamond still has to negotiate a carriage deal with Charter. If they can't work out that agreement, the NBA gets all its rights back. It's not a bad deal for Diamond. It gives them a fighting chance to actually emerge from uh, bankruptcy but it's a great deal for the NBA. All right, that's going to be topic one. Uh, I'll move to my who's up. It's Peyton Manning. And what Peyton Manning has done on ESPN2 and the Manning cast, he's raised the bar for Tom Brady. When Brady comes in next year, uh-oh. Brady meter update. Uh -oh. Brady meter update. Woo! <laughs> 54%. Got a little intel that Brady's engaged. Um, in this, so at 54%, that could sway, it could go up, it could go down, uh, in the next, you know, seven, eight months. But as of right now, Brady meter 54%. Uh, so, uh, that's when he comes in though, this is where I'm getting to, he's going to be compared to Peyton Manning. Now I get it. If Brady does do it, um, with Kevin Burkhart next year, Greg Olson goes number two. Uh, Olson has been excellent, of course, but Brady, people will look at him and that, old time matchup between Manning and Brady. Now Manning's doing it from home. He's doing an alt cast, but what's incredible about Manning. And I watched a lot of the jets game on Monday night, the other day, it's just how he he's orchestrating everything, um, you know, on air. Now, obviously they have a lot of producers and people helping them out uh, him and Eli, but uh, he just is, it's incredible how he can just see the game. And the thing that I've said this before, the thing I love the most though is how annoyed he gets. Like when Zach Wilson is not performing, <laughs> it's like he takes it like it's his own kid who's not performing. And he's just like offended that the position is being played so poorly. The thing is also, he's quick on his feet. Like they showed a, a video of Aaron Rodgers and he had the headset on, you know, with the, for the offensive plays. And he's like, he said something to the effect of, uh, I think he's listening to us. He's not listening to the offensive plays. It's a very quick win. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and then also just being able to see the game and it, and it works with Eli. Uh, they had Keyshawn Johnson on this week, which is hilarious. And Keyshawn was just let go uh, from ESPN with a big contract. Ends up at FS1 uh, and is on Undisputed. They had Undisputed highlight on ESPN2, which you would never think you'd see. Uh, so Peyton Manning can do what he wants. Um, and he's raised the bar for Tom Brady, who's at 54% on the Brady meter. 54. That, that is a big uh, increase. Real quick, I, I've always loved uh, uh, the Manning cast. It's the only way, even with uh, J uh, Joe Buck and Troy Aikman, it's still the only way I watch Monday Night Football. Mm. And you reference this only slightly, but also raising the bar. Greg Olson, who I'm in the bag for anyway, I think he he, he calls a great game. And just this past Sunday, the Cowboys-Eagles uh, game, he was on top of things. He explained things. He predicted things. He just... Uh, I, I th think he's also raising the bar in, in a very big way. That's going to take me to my who's down, though. I'm going to stick with the NFL, and I'm giving it to Roger Goodell, 
Andrew, did you see the primetime games for week 10, the uh, week coming up? Thursday night football, the one and seven Panthers against the two and seven Bears. Sunday night football, the Jets, who you just talked about, at the Raiders, four and five Raiders. Monday night football, the three and five Broncos, the five and four Bills. They're not good games. These are not marquee games that you want to have in prime time. And there are a couple of things in play here. One is the league has added so many windows. There are more national games or more Monday night games. Last week, the Dolphins Chiefs were in Germany. This week, it's the Colts and the Patriots. I mean, you can make a pretty good case that the NFL's game inventory is getting overextended. And you can see that from the prime time things. But there's also one other little talked about rule that is really hurting the league's ability to flex out of these dog games. When the league decided that it didn't want to adhere to traditional AFC and NFC uh, broadcasters anymore. So here in D.C., the Commanders-Giants game, it's been an NFC uh, game on Fox for the past 30 years. It was on CBS this year. But I'm about to get into the weeds here, but Fox is still the NFC broadcaster. CBS is still the AFC broadcaster. And that means that CBS and Fox are both guaranteed one end of the divisional rivalry. So CBS next week Mm -hmm. will get the Steelers Browns because ABC had it before. They don't have to protect those games, which is, again, shrinking the amount of games that can actually be moved. And so we talked a lot about the ability of the NFL to flex into Thursday and about the ability of the NFL to flex into Monday nights this year. I didn't realize at the time that the inventory was going to be so tight that the NFL would have a hard time finding games to flex into it, but it looks like it is. Yeah, that's where Sunday night, yeah, I've heard those rumblings as well about Sunday night having trouble with the flexing of the schedule, Um, and so that's a a good breakdown. John, before we move on, AC Wyatt, our fine producer, just wants to point something out here. John, just as a point of reference, there are three games this week with teams with winning records playing each other. They just happen to all be in the one o'clock window so Ooh, god that's good. that's a killer uh, all right my who's down is youtube tv back to back for youtube back back. tv last week we dinged them for the sunday ticket not working properly did work well uh this week as far as i could tell and what i heard from other people uh so that's a plus for them but you think we cover sports media and it might mean something no when lebron james i always say everybody wants to cover sports media lebron james who has 8 trillion followers on Twitter, says, why does YouTube TV be buffering so damn much? Very frustrating. You don't want that. I mean, we need Darren Ravel to ring that up and tell us how much that's worth. (laughs) (laughs) But I guarantee you that is not good to have a buffering. And then LeBron- Can I jump in for a second? I know it's your who's down, but I I want to give it a negative 672,584 on that, on that tweet alone for YouTube. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That All right, fine. I mean, that's how much money? I think it's millions of dollars. Who knows? But uh, <laughs> we, 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 we need Ravel to chime in in terms of how much that's worth, you know, how much that hurts them. But that's an issue. We talked about a lot last week with streaming um, and- you know, LeBron, who probably listens to the podcast every week, he probably picked up on that, uh, you know, in your points. And, you know, when you're asking people to spend more money, um, you know, for things like uh, Sunday Ticket um, and, you know, all these other entities where you're trying to get all your games, it's got to work. I mean, and I get it. It's a it's a high bar. and It's not easy. And we talk about that's a plus of what Amazon's done on Thursday. It's worked. Um, and you haven't had as many complaints or you know, very few complaints about that. Uh, YouTube TV, if you're the NBA, um, if you're other, if they want to do more, you, you, you got to figure out not to have these errors. They had it last week with Sunday Ticket. Now they got LeBron blasting them. Uh, so they got to get their house in order um, to be real players, in my opinion. So you have confidence if you were to do a deal with them, which brings us to topic one, the NBA. Uh, you wrote a lot about the diamond deal. You talked about it in your who's up. Um, let's go break down um, what this means, what um, people should think about it, its impact on other sports. Um, just overall, um, where are we going with this after the diamond deal? Where do you see it happening? You said the details in the who's up, um, but in terms of what do you think is going to, what do you predict? Okay. So first of all, if you are a cable subscriber in Charlotte next season, you are almost certainly going to be able to watch the Charlotte Hornets play on traditional linear television. 
I don't know what channel yet. They're on the Bally Sports Carolinas right now, uh, but it, it could be Bally Sports Carolina. It could be one of the over-the-air broadcasters, or the NBA could do what the uh, what MLB did with the Padres and the Diamondbacks, which is negotiate uh, just negotiate directly with the distributors in the area and produce the games and and make it available that way. But what to me one of the things that's the most interesting about this deal is that at the end of the season, all the rights revert back to the league. That's the uh, linear TV rights, which the teams are still going to be able to sell to whoever they want. But more importantly, it's the digital rights, all of the digital rights. And so the NBA is going to go to market as they're selling their national TV deals with a whole package of local digital rights. Bill Koenig was at a uh, SBJ conference that I was moderating just uh, last week. And he talked about already seeing interest from uh, Turner, which would put it on Max, ESPN, which would put it on ESPN Plus. And then he, he mentioned the Fang companies. He didn't actually speci specify any of them, but you can read into that, that that would be a Amazon, that would be Apple, potentially it would be Google. Uh, we've talked about Netflix uh, uh, last what week. What does Fang it? stand for again? Fang, F-A-A-N-G, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google. So right. that's sort of the 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 big tech companies uh, okay. that are yeah. out there. Well, a lot of fangs in what you're saying there. Am I, here, here's my <laughs> ooh, question. So, ooh, okay, can we rate that joke, Andrew? <laughs> that was poor. <laughs> All right, whatever. Now I know in um, baseball, uh, they had Diamond had a total of 14 teams. How many NBA teams are affected by this? 15 teams, Andrew. 15 NBA teams. Okay, so then let's break it down. Um, we talked about the fangs. We talked about. HBO Max, ESPN, which is going to go um, direct to consumer by 26, you know, it, probably 25, but 26 is uh, at the latest. And they also have ESPN Plus. The way, you know, I think when you review the NBA, you have to look at distribution. And this is where, to me, Amazon and ESPN um, have an advantage and maybe HBO Max. And I feel like Apple has a disadvantage here. Now, I know they want to have, first off, they want all the teams. Like, would they be happy with just, you know, 15 teams, would that be enough for them where they're not offering everything? I, I don't, that doesn't seem to be their plan. That doesn't seem to be as clean as they like it to be. Let, let, let me just add in the the, the, the the idea is that the NBA would end up getting the NBC teams, the Lakers that are on their own, the Nets that are on their own. They eventually will build up so that they ha have a, a critical mass of, of local. Got it, but not all of them. All right. Facebook's not involved. Netflix I get it that the NBA wants them involved. Maybe that will come to fruition. There's no evidence yet. There's been no evidence that Netflix is a serious player for sports rights for games. Would you agree? I would agree that so far they haven't uh, they haven't been there. Uh, I was told that we were uh, way too dismissive last pod about Netflix and that uh, and that Netflix is um, is somebody that, you know, eventually they're going to make a move into, into sports rights. Will it be with the, the expensive NBA rights that, that are coming out, or will it be, you know, uh, something a little bit further down the road? I, I don't know. They are going to get into sports eventually, don't you think? I always go by, like, this is from covering baseball. Like, you can say whatever you want. I'm going to look at what you do, okay? And so, yeah, I mean, they could talk about it. There's just no, like, look, I would agree. Like, I'm, I said last week, I would not discount Netflix entirely. So if it ends up Netflix, I think it would be a surprise, though, maybe even shocking if it's Netflix. I just don't think they've shown any evidence. Again, there's no evidence that they, they've they discussed it. They, like, do announcements that they're into live sports when they're doing, like, a golf event <laughs> with, like, Grand Prix drivers. I mean, that's not live sports. Anybody who writes that, it's not, that's not live sports. That's, like, doing one event. And they've struggled with, like, they've had – whatever that live show they had that they couldn't even get on the air. Um, and it, there's a lot of infrastructure that comes into play. And so to me, if you look at like an ESPN and you look at, I did that listening tour in the Midwest. And the one thing I took mm -hmm. away from it, I do think that people um, are, they're willing to pay for direct to consumer products, but they want them to make sense economically. And if ESPN plus, for example, were to get it um, and people have ESPN plus, a lot of people do. And, and obviously it would grow with ESPN. If you added a five dollar to ten, that's where I do think that people are willing to pay extra for their teams. Is that five to ten dollar number as opposed to nineteen ninety nine, which you wrote the other day and we've discussed, or higher thirty dollars or something? It's it's designed to keep people in the cable bundle. That's not really a business. That's a business to sustain your 
old business that you think is dying. And so that's your, it's priced to not succeed. And I do think if you looked at it and look, uh, uh, HBO max or just max could, uh, could also just charge $5 or $10 extra for their teams. The problem is they want to, I think, charge for the sports tier. And I do think that you really want something that just is, you're buying one thing. I think if, but if you can just, if it's very easy to understand and it's just $5 for your team or $10 for your team, then I think it can work. But if you start doing, you need max, then you need the sports tier, then you need the, um, your local team, people just get a little bit frustrated and they start adding up the cost. And then they're really looking to see how much they're spending on everything. Yeah. I think two things on that. One is, uh, the the idea of exclusivity i think is going to go away so i think that you know that there's a potential that somebody like amazon or apple will say like we want that and we're going to pay a premium for exclusivity more likely i see espn paying extra in order to get all those rights max paying extra in order to get to get all those rights etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and the other thing is like it, it it is about sort of paying extra and and getting your team but I think the way forward here and, and is sort of almost following an, uh, an NFL model, uh, which is we should stop almost stop thinking about local teams and local games when it comes to digital. There's going to be one of the things that the NBA and the NHL and Rob Manfred, when we had him on the pod, uh, uh, said, is this idea of blackouts is going to be an, an anachronism. Blackouts are something that the regional sports networks enforce because they are paying such high rights fees. They were like, they don't want other teams encroaching on, you know, what they are, are already paying for. As the RSN's power gets diminished, blackouts are going to go away too. So imagine that, that you can just go pay $5 for NBA league pass or whatever. Who, who I, I made up that number. Yep. And and then you get the drop down menu in in Washington D.C. It's like, well, I want to watch you know Wemby and the and the Spurs uh, tonight, or I want to watch Joe Kitchen and, and and the Nuggets tonight, and you just have access to all the games right there. That's gonna cost way more than five dollars, I think, to have. Yeah, access I, I don't to know why games. I said five dollars. I think you, you you were in my head. It totally is. Yeah. But but yeah, so that's number one. But number two, though, the thing that I wrote about this, um, we're gonna get into baseball in a minute, but um, the one thing I do think these leagues have to be careful with, kind of like the Apple approach. Um, is that if you do where you, where you get rid of all the blackouts um, and which is good for the fan, don't get me wrong, but I, I do think, and if you, even if you look kind of largely at the ESPN deal and Turner's deal with the NHL, not fully because there, there are some exclusivities. I do think you're kind of running into an issue where eventually you're only going to have one partner because if you're all, if, if there's one place where you get all the games then why would you need the other partners now i get it you could put some games on broadcast i i suppose but you're going to it's it's hard to divvy them up that way am i wrong yeah i mean uh, certainly uh, when i say the end of blackouts I, I just mean sort of local blackouts for 82 games certainly if espn pays high, pays highly for a friday night window or or a wednesday night window uh, you know, that's going to be that game will, would be exclusive to, to ESPN or else why would they why would they play and, and uh, uh, combat uh, or compete against those local rights? I want to move something up in our rundown and then go back to the NBA because I wrote about the MLB offseason and I think it come, it's the same thing with Diamond Sports um, in terms of Rob Manfred said at the World Series, he thinks they could have control of up to 16 teams um, because of mostly the Diamond Sports uh, situation. They already have two teams that they took over last year, uh, the Padres and the Diamondbacks. Um, and so now there could be even more teams next year. So this is where this is going. Um, and then you could see how an ESPN or a Max or Apple or Amazon maybe tries to get all these sports and all these local rights um, in the question to me, all right, and this is a big off season, um, is can this work? Can they like make the same close to the same amount of money as they were? Because, you know, Manford also announced that the Padres, for example, had 18,000 subscribers, which I did the math is like one point three or four million dollars um, at, uh, I think, seventy five dollars a year. They're going to get 60 million from Sinclair. Now, that difference was made up by MLB, but they're not going to be able to do that probably forever. Um so can this work? I think it can work. Um, one of the themes of this pod since we started it is just how great the cable bundle was 
for leagues and for teams. So you have your proverbial grandmother down the street who's helping you to subsidize my addiction to watching the Orioles. And so that's going away. But at the same token, local rights still have a lot of value. One of the things that the NBA is believing is that they can make up whatever shortfall there is in local rights with their national TV deal. And one of, one of the other things that's really happening uh, uh, is that these local broadcast channels, they're not paying as much as the RSNs, but they see a, a big value in these local rights. And, and some of them are paying pretty good money. So I don't think the drop, the drop off isn't nearly as severe as you suggested with the Padres from, you know, 60 million to 1 million. Well, they're also we're getting sat. They're also I did that doesn't include cable and satellite fees. Yeah, and so so the there there will be a drop off. Uh, the question is whether or not the, the the leagues will be able to make up that drop off, and uh, and and whether or not other other like local broadcasters are able to step in sort of to 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 help um, make that work. Well, they're overvalued. It's hard to make up for overvalued money. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're 60 million is probably too much for the Padres. And so now you're trying to make up for money that was probably inflated to begin with. Let me ask you, this is more NBA. Um, I do think they want broadcast, right? Then they, they will in theory get that because ESPN and ABC seem like they will retain rights. That's a, something that we think, how real do you think NBC is? Because I do think when you look at all these places, you know, Fox already said they're out. CBS said they're out. Um, I do think these executives are looking at their books and saying, where is this money coming from? You talked about last week with ABC and Monday Night Football entering the, the market as a broadcast channel for this season, how the, the market, the advertising market is soft. I don't know. Like, I think, you know, the NBA thing is going to do fine, but I don't know if like, you know, you got to be careful that you're not bidding against yourselves if you're these places, because I'm not sure if there's going to be, um, besides the digital players who haven't overspent, if you said it, you've said a number of times, you know, besides the digital players, where's the leverage coming from? I mean, that that's a great question. So the reason that uh, I'm so optimistic about the NBA is if they have three bit, uh, if they have three packages, they have at least four bidders, ESPN, um, Turner, NBC, and, and Amazon, potentially Apple. Uh, all you need is one more bidder potentially Netflix, as we said, all you need is one more bidder than uh, th than packages that you have. The NBA, they, they get big audiences for their big events and they have a, what, what they say in the TV biz, a great demo. You know, it's a, it's young males that, that want to spend on advertising, uh, that av advertisers want to reach that, uh, that watch uh, NBA games uh, uh, traditionally. And so I, th I think the NBA is fine. My big story for the next year or so is what falls on the, uh, on the bad side of it. The Pac-12 obviously fell on the bad side of it. That's a power five football conference that all of a sudden like couldn't find uh, the TV dollars in order in order to, uh, to to survive. I mean, f f I never would have picked uh, picked the Pac-12 as somebody going under. MLS couldn't come up with uh, linear TV bids and, and and ended up going go, going to Apple. Uh, I, I think where we see that line is all of a sudden it's getting higher and higher and higher. And if I'm sort of a, a mid-level league, I do not want my rights coming up right now. All right, John, one last thing before we move off. The uh, NBA in-season tournament started last week. Nice ratings for ESPN. Um, what did you think? Uh, what, what's your take on that one? My take was, did you watch? I watched and some. So I, I happened to be in a bar at the time and like the visually it was stunning on, on television, just the, the vibrant colors coming out off the t uh, TV. It just, uh, it, it had great visuals. Uh, the numbers I have to say were a lot better than I was expecting. I uh, just based on a panel of uh, friends of mine, people didn't really know what the in-season tournament was, weren't really following it. ESPN saw good numbers. Turner saw good numbers for it. And the thing about the in-season tournament, because we're going to be talking about it as it progresses, the NBA is certainly doing it next year, regardless of what the numbers are. And they're almost it's almost certainly going to be part of their NBA rights package uh, that comes out in, in in two years' time, regardless of what these numbers are. But the numbers early on were very good. Well, I think this is here forever. I mean, I also think that we live in like a today world, right? Like, you know, when a new broadcaster comes up, it's like they have like five minutes to 
decide if they're good or bad because Twitter and social media decides. And then it's like, that's it. And that's not how things actually work. Um, you got to give people time. And I think this is something where kind of similarly to the WBC with baseball, which I do think has, you know, still has some hiccups that, you know, they kind of, it's going to be like a, you know, not, maybe not the world cup, but like something that, you know, impactful, it takes time. So I, my, I think I've said it before. I thought the NBA is really smart uh, to put this together. I think it has a chance to be something, you know, they have to figure out a way to make the regular season more interesting. And this is a way that these are, you know, regular season games that they're dressing up and, you know, it, it leads someplace. So I, I think it has a chance to be something that people get into. Um, and I, I think it's smart. Like, is it going to be the biggest thing ever? I don't know. But I do think that over time, if you're a kid who's eight years old and this is when you're just starting to watch the NBA and there's something called the NBA cup, you know, by it, you do that for 15 years and you're 23 and all of a sudden it's like, Oh, NBA cup time. And I think that's how it grows. And it just doesn't happen overnight, but off to a good start. Well, listeners know that you're a big soccer fan. And so you understand the premise behind it with the FA cup and with the different cups there. You know, I, I lived in London for a couple of years. I, I, I understand what I've seen the excitement around uh, winning the FA cup in, uh, in, in England. So I think it, it is a smart thing to do and it's not going to happen overnight for the NBA. But I want to go to a, another topic, MLB, your newsletter that comes out every Monday morning, really went deep into, into what MLB needs to do this offseason to, uh, to capture some of what I thought was a lot of excitement from the rules changes of uh, the past season. Yeah, well, I just think we're coming to a head of something we've talked about. You you mentioned, you know, at the end of last year when we kind of were talking about what's coming on the storm of um, of regional sports networks and, and, you know, what's going on with them. And so baseball, like we talked about earlier with diamond sports is in the middle of it. We saw it last year. So that's going to like the, these decisions that MLB and Rob Manfred and Adam silver, and then the executives at these networks, it's going to, the future of sports is going to be decided, you know, in terms of how well they do it, where they go. Um, and so that's going to come to fruition, you know, over the next year. Um, so that, that's one thing. I also think on the national side of things. I talked about this a couple of weeks ago in my newsletter. I do think it's a real possibility that ESPN looks at that opt out it has in two years for MLB and decides, well, would you rather invest that money in the NBA, in the NCAA or pocket the money? Um, or do they use it as leverage to try to get the local rights deals um, you know, involved uh, in ESPN direct to consumer? So I do think that's real. Peacock's deal is Sunday morning. Baseball is up. Um, do they renew that? Uh, going into uh, next year. And so when you look at it, I think, and I think there's a good chance they do probably, um, there's a lot of change. And at the end of it, um, you know, if I say what the count is to use the baseball analogy, I think baseball, this was not a, the, the sky is falling type of column. I think baseball is in much better position than a lot of people think. Um, I, I think it's a two, one count right now. And, you know, it could easily go to two, two real quick. Um, but you also could be three, one and Manfred could be looking to drive a ball into the gap or over the fence. I think baseball is better positioned. So let me ask you a question, Andrew. We're just coming off a world series, all time record low viewership for world series, even lower than 2020, which was a, a previous all time low. That was of course the, the, the COVID year that there has to be a little bit of pessimism that's coming out, out of that. Don't you think a little bit, but I think they got five games at Texas, um, and, the Diamondbacks. So yeah, that was a bad matchup. But I think if you look at game five, the ratings were up. And if they had gotten a six and a seven, I think they would have been, you know, they wouldn't have been great because he didn't have a great matchup. And that's what you get with baseball. But like as Mike Mulvihill, the president of analytics of Fox, you know, said it beat everything in entertainment. Now, again, I, I just think baseball, everyone wants to always compare things to football. And it's just like, I've said this a million times, but I'll keep saying it because it's the mantra. If you played 17 Yankee games, what would the ratings be? Okay. I'm not saying they'd be the same as football. Football would probably still be higher, but they, they'd be more comparable. And I just think like when we get to the world series, yeah, it's not 1965 anymore. Um, it's just, it, but it, it's still, it's held its audience in a lot of regards and it's a national sport that really is local. If that, you know, so I, I just think it has a better story to tell. And I just think if you look at how many, you know, people always talk about kids that aren't playing. Well, I think if you look at kids like six to 12, I was told a stat the other day from an MLB person that more boys play little league from six to 12 than any other sport. Um, so the, the idea that this sport is dying um, has been going on forever. 
And I just don't think that's true. But I, but I do think it's at a crossroads in terms of what is going to happen with the media deals. And I do think the new rules really help them shorten the games up. And, and I think it's, it's on the upswing, which brings us to the NFL. You had a stat the other day uh, on the NFL, Germany game, Chiefs and Dolphins. Uh, what'd you have? We, we haven't seen the ratings yet, but, but uh, I did notice in Kansas City, in the Kansas City market, that game, which, uh, which started early morning on a Sunday morning, had a 94 share. That means 94% of the TVs that were on in the Kansas City market were watching the Chiefs. You don't see that number in for, for any event. I, I said it was in the running to be the highest ever, just period. That's only because I, I don't know if it is or not. It's it's higher than anything I've ever seen. It's a, it's a preposterous number. And there are two things that, that are going to come from this. One is my who, who's down uh, this week was Roger Goodell. And he was who's down because they're spreading everything so thin. You know, there's so many international games. Well, that number shows like you, you, that, that we're going to see a lot more international games. The NFL is not going to slow that down at all. And the other thing is something that... Uh, you know, uh, NBC learned with uh, with the Premier League. Uh, the Peacock was learning with uh, with, with uh, its Major League Baseball package that it had. There is a window on weekend mornings that sports fans are getting up and watching television, and sort of how all the leagues start to uh, try to attack those uh, those weekend mornings is uh, something that I would ex- expect to see. Yeah, I didn't love it though. I got to be honest with you because. I mean, like I spend the whole day watching football and, you know, it's a great thing to do. It's part of the job and I love it, but it, I like it starting a little bit later. Like where I like, again, that was a great game. So you really wanted to watch that game each week. There haven't been great games. That was the game of the week. So you really wanted to see it, uh, you know, at 9 30 AM um, and the ratings, you know, will probably show that they were you know better than, than most of those games. Uh, but I, I don't love it personally. Andrew, let's bring in our big get. Uh, you and I first got to know our big get back when he was slinging PR for Dick Ebersol and NBC Sports. I believe this is our first PR hand to appear on the Marshando Moran Sports Media Podcast. Mike McCarley, welcome. Thanks, guys. It's uh, it's great to be with you. I appreciate it. And, you know, he kind of moved on. to Yeah, let's, uh, let's continue. My, McCarley left <laughs> the PR world in the dust. He went to run sports marketing at the network. Uh I got to bring this up. Mike coined the phrase Sunday night is football night, which I still use more than a decade, uh, almost uh, 15 years after you first came up with it. I I get a little bit of smile. And if I'm home and I hear Al Roker uh, doing that on a Friday morning, I I still I still get a little grin thinking about that. Ran the golf channel for a decade and now uh, teamed up with Tiger uh, Woods, Rory McIlroy on Tomorrow Golf, a venture that's been around for a couple of years. It's going to launch in January in prime time on ESPN. I know you hate the word virtual golf, but it's kind of like virtual golf. Players are going to hit like long shots, like drivers to eight irons into a a 60 foot tall screen uh, and then chip and putt onto an actual real green. Team golf event, 15 regular season matches, semis, finals, all-star group of investors, Ebersol, Michael Rubin, Greg Maffei, Steph Curry, Josh Allen. I'm particularly looking forward to watching this, Mike. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's been fun last really almost four years putting all this together. You know, doing it almost in in total secrecy, Tiger and Rory and small team of people. And then, you know, when we announced it, and then it's just been building it ever since. But having having great partners, you know, is a great place to start. And uh they just help you help you get it done. So you were at Golf Channel and then now you're doing this. Um, how does this all come together? Like, what is the, how does this start? How does this come together? Yeah, I had always had this idea that you could take this technology that exists uh, in different pockets and you could put it together in a way um, that you could actually create a competition. And that, that, you know, you guys know that you can't watch a football game without a yellow first and 10 line anymore, especially if you're a, a new fan. Very same thing in golf with the, with the tracer line. You know, all of this tech on television has really demystified the sport for a lot of people. So in in some ways, I think it's an eventuality that you'll bring more and more, more and more tech into sports because 
Uh, so much is now used in the players in different sports, athletes in different sports to prepare for the competition. Um, if you go to a range at a PJ tour event, you know, everyone's got some sort of launch monitor, some sort of device. They're, they're getting all of this data. Um, and, and Tiger, uh, was an investor in a company called Full Swing, uh, that I was fairly close to their CEO, Ryan Dodders, um, and started talking to Tiger's team. He's got uh, a guy named Rob McNamara, who's very close to him, who I've known Rob. We actually first met when we were in college together a long time ago. And we just kind of started talking about how the technology is used, how Tiger uses it. And little things were sticking in my head, like Tiger will play a golf course that he's got a tournament coming up, you know, in a few weeks. He'll play it uh, in a simulator just to remind him of the shots that he needs to hit. Um, very similar to what a, a lot of the uh, race car drivers in the different uh, leagues around the world will, will train on a simulator in their homes to kind of learn that race course because you don't have access to the course because it's a street course or something like that. Just like, you know, flying around the country or the world to get to that golf course just to prepare isn't feasible for them or isn't realistic. Um, so when, when I started having those conversations with Tiger and his team and started developing the idea, it was in the middle of pandemic. Um, you know, screens were kind of changing our lives. I mean, you know, something like this uh, was not commonplace then. So I started working with with some of the different tech companies and just asking them, okay, how big can you actually make this? You know, this is this is what you buy uh, if you wanted to install a simulator at your home or office. And th what we're going to have uh, in the SoFi Center, when they come to start playing in January, it's 20 times larger than the actual simulator screen that you would buy uh, and install in your house. Um, the green is a giant green complex that, that moves and transforms. So the technology uh, had, it existed, but it had never been deployed at this sort of grand scale or deployed kind of all together in, in one place before. Uh, and the vision was really try to create a you know, almost like an NBA courtside experience for a fan uh, where you can see every single shot, everything's live. There's, there's no shot on tape, which means all the data is live as well, which is something in golf that, you know, because there's 156 players in a tournament, 18 different holes, you get all these balls in the air at one time. And as good as uh, the producers are who are producing golf now, you, you can only show one shot uh, live at a time. So that means a lot's on tape. So from a data standpoint, sports betting, uh, you know, this is kind of taking a lot of the tailwinds that we're all seeing in the industry and putting it all into one place. You have like, you know, a lot of big name investors, but how do you close the deal with Tiger and Rory that, that they, that they're going to be involved in this? And what was that like for you? Yeah, well, look, I, you know, we had known each other, uh, and we're, I've worked with their teams on projects in the past. So that, that piece, um, was fairly simple. I mean, I knew I had one meeting with Tiger at the beginning where we had done several months worth of work kind of leading up to that and 90 minutes. And he's asking me all these questions. And at the end of it, he just looked at me and he said, look, I understand the technology. I completely get it. If I commit to doing this, will you commit to doing it too? And at that moment, uh, you know, it's like, all right, I guess, I guess I'm doing this. Um, and then he said, okay, so what do we do now? And I said, well, you don't have to do anything. I'm going to have a conversation with Rory. Um, and then together, the three of us will go to the PGA Tour and bring them on board as a partner. Um, and that was something that we always had in, in kind of the front of our mind is this needed to be complementary to the existing schedule of the players and kind of additive, uh, not making a player choose. Are they going to, are they going to keep their regular schedule and then and then try to choose to do this or, or not. So two weeks later, I had a conversation with Rory, uh, pretty much before he even started explaining it to him. He's, you know, when he found out Tiger was on board and Rory and I had done some projects before together and he was in. So that point we were kind of off and running. You know, the thing about being a TV executive, whenever they come up with a, a new concept, it's always like, you know, this is the PGA tour meets esports. Like, yeah. how did you with describe, yeah. <laughs> how did you yeah. describe this to uh, TV executives? Yeah, I, look, I think it, it's, it's like sitting courtside at an NBA game. You know, if you think about um, what, what that experience is like, whether you're sitting in the arena uh, at, 
in a venue or you're watching at home, it's the elements of, you know, the lights, the music, the player introductions, all of that that you get kind of the show around it. The golf shots, it's the same exact physical move that the guys make on out on the golf course. It's the same strategy they put into place. Um, the reality is you're just seeing everything happen right in front of you, which was something that Tiger kind of latched on to immediately because he's it's hard to follow him around a golf course uh, if you're a fan and you're going to see, you know, not even every other shot, you're going to see several shots and you're walking eight miles. And the reality is if you decide you want to sit at a place on a golf course and kind of watch the guys come to you on a green or something, it's, it more replicates that, but how do you condense it into one place so you can actually see every shot happen in front of you? Um, and that's where the technology came in. It's like, okay, we can shrink a 200-acre plot of land with 18 different fields of play down into one field of play that's roughly the size of a football field, and every fan in the arena can see it, and we can produce the television you know, a lot like you would a basketball game or a football game where you've got fixed cameras everywhere, you've got a sky cam going over the top, um, you've got cameras embedded in bunkers and, and in, in the grass and things like that. And just give a great media experience to the fan at home and a really unique experience to the fans who are watching in the stands. All right. So you have 15 regular season matches. Yeah. How often do you are you expecting Tiger to play in those? So each so there's six teams in the league. So each is more or less round robin for this season, for the regular season. So each team will play the other team five times, the other teams five times. So each team will have five. So Tiger will play five times, Rory will play five times. Justin Thomas plays five times on, on their teams. And so when you think about the ratings, what kind of goal do you have with ESPN? I mean, I, the great thing about ESPN is in the first meeting I had with them, which was over a year ago, uh, Burke Magnus got the concept immediately and just said, I want to figure out a way to do this with you. Um, and they look, the, the reality is, you know, a, a typical televised round of golf is four and a half hours, and this is two hours. So it's it fits into a schedule a lot like a basketball game. And, you know, they're looking at this. Um, is this a, a from a rating standpoint, is it a good college basketball game? Is it an NBA game? It's kind of in that in that wheelhouse. And obviously it's going to be uh, dependent on what the matchup is and how close it is. But, you know, Tiger tends to. uh Juice the rating quite a bit. We've seen that for almost 30 years now in in, uh, in sports television. So it's kind of a TV show. I mean, when you think about it, is that is that fair? Yeah. I mean, look, it's a competition. When the guys are playing each other, they're competing. Uh, they're they're playing for 21 million dollars. The the purse is uh, nine million to the winning team. So it's legit competition. And these guys, you know, they're some of the most competitive people on the planet. Um, but the show around it, you know, when they're not standing over their ball about to hit a shot, everyone's mic'd up. You want to hear the the audio, the commentary, having them talk trash to each other um, and then talk about the strategy. So a lot of the format of the actual game itself was designed to have the players talk to each other in a way that they're comfortable talking to each other out on the golf course, which is about the actual strategy of the gameplay. And what tends to happen is once they get comfortable talking to each other about that, then they start talking about, you know, other things. And that's where some of the some of the funnel come in for sure. You know, Mike, one of the topics that we've been sort of ODing on over the past couple of weeks is about the the uh, shrinking marketplace for sports rights. And, you know, given cord cutting, traditional TV doesn't have as many uh, as much money to spend the uh, the, the big tech companies. Aren't, come, aren't spending as wildly as everybody h- hoped for. When you went to market, like, how would you describe the, the market out there? Um, I think that the timing of it all, if you think about, um, it's been going up and up and up for so long. And I think everyone was pointing to some sort of correction. I, I think the reality is it's just going to kind of recalibrate and settle in. And then I think it'll continue to climb. But the rea- the reality is when when the day that Netflix uh, missed their uh, their numbers, it, I think it changed for everybody, right? It, it, it changed from being a, uh, a subscriber count measured uh, success and it got back to EBITDA, you know, real business fundamentals. Um, and the reality is I think 
it may be that way for some time, but I think, you know, tier one sports properties, we're kind of thinking about the marketplace as a whole are going to continue to be, you know, unbelievably important, not just for the bundle, but just for viewing in general. I mean, you guys know the numbers as well or better than I do. I mean, just look at what the NFL is doing and how it's just this absolute juggernaut that won't stop. Uh, and I think we're going to say the same thing across a bunch of other leagues as well. Now, you know, a lot of our audience knows a lot about you um, and we detailed some of it. That's but, <laughs> <laughs> but they have, but you have a deep understanding of the media and golf. Um, yep. And, you know, obviously that's been one of the bigger stories over the last year with Liv and, and the PGA. Just first off, what yeah. do you, no, I, was I haven't, heard, I little, little I haven't heard about that. No, I've heard about that one? All right. Well, well, even if you haven't heard about it, what's your opinion on it? Like, give us your global. What do you, what do you, where are we going? What do you think? Look, I think uh, where we're headed in some sort of eventuality of, you know, it, it all coming back together. And I think the reality is the changes that the PGA Tour made um, to get the top players playing head to head in the same events more regularly is exactly what the fans want. And, and you know, even in, in even for TGL, when I first started talking to Tiger and Rory about it, it was about getting the best players in the world playing head to head on a more regular basis. I mean, look, we are in a star driven world now. And if you can get stars competing on the screen uh, more often, I think that's that's what people want. And if you know, anyone you're kind of thinking about what what's the best thing for the fan? What does the fan want? And if you're trying to give the fan what they want, I think you're always going to be on the right track. When you start to move too far away from that, I think that's where you can get into trouble. So what actually happens? I do not have a crystal ball, so it's really hard to predict. Um, but I, I think the, the, there's a lot of uh, of positive momentum around the game of golf, not just professional golf, but you know, from participation, everything that was really started by Top Golf and and Pop Stroke and some of these other elements, there are more people playing golf uh, in the United States, not on a traditional golf course. There are simulators and Top Golf and, and other places than there are playing on actual golf courses, and that's a trend that we saw across Asia for a really long period of time, the last ten years or so. Uh, and it just happened uh, last year uh, in the United States. So I think we'll continue to see that all along. And the pandemic had a, a lot to do with it because everyone started, you know, golf was one of the few things that we could all do because you're naturally socially distant. And, and a lot of people took up the game. Does the live merger go through? Well, it's not a merger, but it's a, it's a framework for an agreement. But okay. yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's some scenario where, where it probably should. Um, what does that look like? I have no idea. Um, you know, you got really smart people on on both sides who are hopefully, uh, and they have, I think, you know, come together and, and try to come up with with something that's the right thing uh, for the long term. Are lift golfers in the TGL? No, no. Part of our, uh, it, it's PGA Tour players um, are are the ones who who are. And, and the reality is, is, the way the schedule works, we've kind of we built it around the player schedules. That's a that's a PGA Tour schedule. So you said something earlier about sort of uh, you know, the PGA Tour uh, trying to cater to the fans, make it what 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 fans want. You used to be president of the Golf Channel. I can't think of it. too many people that know more about what golf fans want uh, than you. What can you give some, some uh, specifics on? You guys know. I mean, you tune in when you've got a great leaderboard late on a Sunday, late on a Saturday, um, and, and how do you get that? You get a great leaderboard when you get the best players in the world going head to head more often. Um, and naturally, I think, you know, the cream rises to the top. You've got these great storylines of guys who may you know, come out of nowhere or just qualified. And the reality is, you know, anyone who makes makes it into that field uh, that starts on a Thursday has a chance to win. Um, but, I you know, the fans want to see the best players in the world uh, going head to head. And that's a big part of you know the kind of the early formation of what we were doing and we've we've seen it with with full swing on netflix you've got a group of you know 20 or so players there um that all of a sudden not not sports fans but people who probably didn't care about golf uh before all of a sudden they know about sahit the gala and joel damon and some of these people that you know an average sports fan may never have heard of before 
So I think the reality is once you kind of get who are those stars and then how are they going to go head to head? Um, I think that's where that's where the magic comes in. And I think we'll start to see more and more of that because you've got a lot of elements in golf, full swing being one of them, some of the participation elements where just more people are getting in the game, where a lot of that is coming. TGL is one where it's all coming together. My final question, Andrew, is uh, so you, you launch in January. Uh, what are you most excited about? I've been excited the whole time because you're, you're, you know, there's something that's really kind of pure about this. You're taking a sport that's got 600 years of history and tradition, and you're, you're kind of reimagining it for um, today's audience. Like if we were going to create a sport today, what would it, what would it be? Uh, and it borrows from the traditions of golf. Um, but it's, it's really, and it's kind of firmly rooted in those traditions but it's also thinking about, you know, what does the fan want in, in today's age and how can we kind of recreate this? So the, the reality is you've got a, a the, when a guy hits a 300 yard drive, that's a two and a half minute walk. Right. And so if you're, you're watching that, uh, that that's when the television network's going to go to commercial or you're going to other guys, other places on the golf course, um, usually on tape. And in this scenario, with every shot being live, that 300-yard uh, drive, instead of it being a two-and-a-half-minute walk, it's now a 10-foot walk over to the bench area. Guys grab their next club, shot clock kicks in, and they're ready to go for their, for their next shot. So condensing what is normally a four-and-a-half, five-hour round of golf on television down to two hours in prime time that's digestible in a lot of ways when we look – I'm sure you guys have done a lot of uh, work with, with the baseball rules and the positive effects that that's had. I mean, you know, 30 minutes off of a game and in the average game in two years is remarkable. And that means, you know, more families are watching together. Uh, more kids are able to stay up and see the end of the game and kind of the long-term effects of that uh, can be incredibly positive. And I think, you know, you look at something like that and you say, okay, this is a short form version of golf. It is, it is, different than the traditional game um not not better or worse it's just different uh but it is geared towards a more modern uh kind of day and time and audience when, when people are just crunched for time and they don't, they don't necessarily have time to sit and watch uh you know an entire long presentation of something they can get a bite-sized piece of it they can get introduced to who these players are what their personalities are um and then hopefully that translates to you know, more and more people who are watching on a Saturday and Sunday when you get the same guys on a leaderboard. Last thing for me, Mike, when you were at NBC doing PR, you had perfect hair and you still have perfect <laughs> hair. Meanwhile, I had curly hair. It's a lot grayer. It's not a lot grayer. Back. A it's, gray lot grayer. it's only a little bit grayer. Dude, a little gray it's and back. Gray. How you kept all your yeah. hair. That means yeah. you either haven't worked hard or I don't know. What does that mean? I don't know. I don't I'm know. I'm working pretty hard. I'm working All right, pretty well, hard. Yeah. Well, hopefully no more, you know, no, you don't get more gray hair from this um, launch. I don't think you will. It sounds like you have a good plan uh, and you can't really go wrong with Tiger and Rory and um, the whole thing. And so we really appreciate uh, you giving us the time being the big get this week um, and uh, best of luck with everything. Yeah. Good luck, man. Hey, thank you guys. Appreciate it. You guys keep, keep having fun. I mean, the service I think that you're providing for the industry by doing this podcast has been fantastic. I mean, you've got people who can just listen in with you guys every week and, and get a nice little education about what's going on in the world it's been in this little business. It's great. Appreciate hey, it. Marketing. Clip that. Clip that marketing. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thanks, man. All right. See you guys. Andrew, there's something that uh, McCarley said uh, that I've, I found particularly interesting and, and that's, you know, TV is about stars. And you, you see that in, in basketball. Uh, you see that certainly in, in, in football. Like, to look at the Jets ratings, you know, where they were expecting to have uh, Aaron Rodgers in there. He is aligning himself right now with Tiger Woods, who is the biggest draw in the history of golf, in, in, in my opinion. Rory McIlroy, another huge draw. If the TGL is going to work, it's going to work because those stars are there. They're playing they're engaged and fans want to see him. So I, I, I like his chances with, with, uh, with those two. Yeah. Especially tiger. I mean, I, you just tiger is invested in it. Um, and I just think that's a total win because, um, tiger, you know, we talk about 
Apple with Messi. It's kind of a Taylor Swift deal. Um, I kind of think this is a little bit of a Taylor Swift deal as well. When you get Tiger involved, like if Tiger wasn't involved, you know, are we talking about this? I'm not sure. Like, you know, Roy McIlroy is great too, but Tiger is, uh, you know, he's Taylor Swift for golf. Wait, um, Rory, so, Rory is a uh, Katy Perry then? Is that what you're saying? People can comment. I'm not sure. I don't, I, I think that sounds dated <laughs> to me, Katy Perry, but honestly, maybe Olivia, Olivia Rodriguez. Uh, there you go. Yeah. I just dropped that on you. I know. I'm you, a hip. You, you must, you must have daughters. In- yeah. I, look, I'm, I'm, I'm with the pop culture. Um, <laughs> I'm with it. I'm hip. Uh, I did see Springsteen uh, this summer. You know, you have Tiger involved and people are going to be interested in, you know, but the question is, it's not what it, you know, I think initially it's going to do well. Um, the question is week 10, uh, you know, how's it do? Um, but if you have Tiger every three weeks, basically, um, you're going to have some buzz, I think. So uh, I think it, it, you know, again, it's not going to, it's not, it's not designed to compete with the actual tournaments. It's there to, to be a compliment, but $21 million, that's a pretty good compliment in terms of prize money. What? It's a compliment. Andrew, that brings us to the end of another pod, another week with the uh, Marchand Orient Sports Media Podcast. Uh, thanks, as always, Chris Mason, master of the board, uh, AC Wyatt, who made a rare appearance on today's podcast. Always good to get a- AC to chime in uh, like that. Uh, please like, subscribe, comment if you can. We always hear that that helps with things. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. You're still on mute. I'm purposely on mute. Oh, there you go. <laughs> right? So Try we didn't to, hear I you didn't have the mic thing? up when we came on. Now it's getting up in progress. I can hear you guys mocking me. Chris, <laughs> let's cut that out. <laughs> oh, no, let's we'll leave it in. We'll leave it in. Let the people let the people hear that we have bad jokes. All right. They think we're hilarious. So no, nobody thinks we're funny. But hopefully they like the podcast. Andrew, what's do you uh put like powder on your dome before you do this? Oh it's wow, like, look at you. Dude. I was noticing that it's very shiny here today. No, 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 it's not. I was just that's because I was kind of wondering. Like oh no, nah, no powder. This is all natural. Last time I saw you, you had like the full like head of yeah, the hair. I'm like, I'm just still trying to get my head around the yeah, no the hair. <laughs> but it's good. I like it. it looks uh, good. Well, I didn't really have a choice. I mean I know. Man. But I kinda I took control of the situation. Control, control, you must run control.